Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! There's, there's, I've got this new habit at the moment of finding stories that lend themselves very easily to, to traditional um, set twos and trying to find a question that's a little bit more illuminating. So a school has been accused, or at least a head teacher has been accused, of victim shaming after pupils claimed they were told that wearing a longer skirt could protect them from sexual harassment. It's uh, one of those... Uh, hardly perennials, isn't it, really, of, of conversation, but one which oddly sees the old horseshoe effect come into place because the idea that women should dress modestly in order to somehow douse the uncontrollable desires of men is something that, that people on um, the uh, very right wing of politics and the very fundamentalist religious types both believe, that, you know, the High Court judge who says to a victim of rape that she shouldn't have worn a, a short skirt is on exactly the same page in many ways as the mad mullah who tells a woman that she has to cover her face. So I, I'm drawn to the question of whether it's ever true, whether actually you do receive more harassment simply when you're wearing a shorter skirt or a lower cut top than you do when you're not. I'm not, I mean, I'm, obviously I'm a bloke, I've got real no idea on this, and I certainly don't have a, a particularly long um, record of, of sexually harassing women, so I don't, I'm going to be completely in the dark. I'm not making light of anything. But I just actually wondered whether we've ever asked if it's simply true. I don't, at first glance, think it is, but... Obviously, women will know better, and they will tell me in the course of the programme. Um, we're going to begin with a with a story that I mean, this is real deep end stuff. This is this isn't you know, uh, oh, say something controversial, make the phones ring. This is really heavy lifting, but bear, bear with me because it's important. You will know, and I, and I stress this, I, I wish I didn't have to, but things are so teamy now, aren't they? Things are so pick a side and fight. Uh, there was a great little tweet this morning which said, uh, Twitter a few years ago would be, I like apples, and someone else says, oh, I like pears. And then the person who said he liked apples says, oh, really? Oh, fair enough. Have a nice day. Now, Twitter and, and life at large is a little bit more, I like apples. Why do you hate pears, you scumbag? And it is very much like that, especially when it comes to domestic British politics. I mean, anybody who has listened to this particular radio program for more than six seconds will know that we've been fairly equal opportunities in our castigating of party leaders in recent years. Um, the phrase politically homeless has become something of a mantra. And yet, if you were to dip your toe into some of the weirder reaches of, of interaction at the moment, you'd know that if you criticise Theresa May, it means you love Jeremy Corbyn. And if you crit criticise Jeremy Corbyn, it means that you love Oswald Mosley um, or Theresa May or, or, or anyone else on that side of politics. We try to plough a lonely course between the extremes on this programme. And a story like this one lets us because I don't understand why Conservative MEPs who collectively refused to censure um, the Hungarian government of Viktor Orban in the European Parliament on Wednesday have essentially um, failed to condemn a regime whose anti-Semitism makes the Labour Party's problems, to my eye, look smaller. Not small, just smaller. The members of the European Parliament have voted overwhelmingly today to take action against Hungary, accusing Viktor Orban's government of a systemic threat to democracy and rule of law. It's the first time Article 7 has been triggered against a member state, just the start of a long process which could lead to Hungary's voting rights being suspended. But most British Conservative MEPs voted against the move. Fatima Manji reports. A standing ovation for the woman who made the case against Hungary. Dutch parliamentarian Judith Sargentini accused Viktor Orban's government of posing a systematic threat to EU values. Today, more than two-thirds of MEPs overwhelmingly backed a motion to launch disciplinary action against the country. It's the first time the European Parliament has used the procedure known as Article 7, which could lead to Hungary being stripped of its voting rights. The Hungarian government reacted furiously, denouncing the vote as a witch hunt and a fraud. 
Today's decision by the European Parliament is nothing more than petty revenge against Hungary by pro-immigration politicians. Yesterday, Viktor Orban made a dramatic late entrance into the debate, a clear message that he would not be cowed by this assembly. Hungary will not accede to this blackmailing. Hungary will protect its borders, stop illegal migration and will defend its rights. Hungary is accused of abuse against asylum seekers and migrants. Viktor Orban's government has claimed immigration is a threat to the country's national security. It's passed the so-called Stop Soros law, which criminalizes activists who help asylum seekers. The Sargentini report against Hungary also details concerns about corruption and a crackdown on press freedoms. On the newsstands in Budapest, Viktor Orban's message dominates. But the headlines haven't convinced everyone. It would be good if the EU could somehow recognize not everyone agrees with this restrictive and almost dictatorial government. For sure the EU measures won't be any good for the country, but they should somehow regulate this fool. Back in Strasbourg, many in the same right-wing coalition as Viktor Orban voted against him. But there was some support for Hungary. No. Nigel Farage condemned the vote, calling it authoritarian. And the majority of British Conservative MEPs voted with Mr Orban, claiming the motion was misguided and counterproductive. But if punishment against Hungary is to be taken further, all member states would have to agree, which is unlikely. The EU remains divided between those countries who want it to stand up for its core values and those who disagree. Fatima Manji, well earlier I spoke to Judith Sargentini, who has been leading the process to activate Article 7 against Hungary. And I began by asking her if her critics in the European Parliament were right to suggest that her report could prejudice any legal action. If they are, they are in a minority because th uh, two-thirds of the European Parliament thinks it is the right time to take political actions towards Hungary. The European Commission has been taking legal actions year after year, but this is about something wider. This is touching everything in Hungarian society, which you cannot solve with a court case, because this is about political will. At some point in the process, you need almost unanimous votes can you secure such a thing Th that's out of my hands what i secured today which is the first time ever is a two-third majority from left to right in the european parliament through all countries that says we cannot stand by and see how the government of hungary is filling its personal pockets uh, with European funding, money that should be spent on services of citizens. And that's where we are now. Let's not underestimate the signal. And let's not underestimate that it is also the European People's Party, the biggest group in the House, the Christian Democrats, of which the government of, uh, of, of Hungary, its, its ruling party, Fidesz, is a member, that said so too. This is a very delicate moment because there are other far-right parties beginning to move into either coalition or actual government in other countries. Is this set to be an example to other states in the European Union or merely a Hungarian problem? Well, this is primarily solidarity with Hungarian citizens that are deprived from uh, equal treatment and rule of law. Um, and I take the signal that uh, Councillor Kurz of Austria has given two days ago that he supports the report I've written and he supports the fact that his members here in Parliament have voted for it. I take that as a very positive signal. Are you alarmed by the fact that uh, when you look at the two-thirds majority, those who did not support you, some of them are quite conventional, middle-of-the-road, right-wing parties? Well, I have a different idea of what is conventional. Not supporting this report is actually not a good thing. And if we saw who applauded Viktor Orban's yesterday in the European Parliament plenary when he spoke, it was the extreme right alone. But it's the British Conservatives, some of them, who are complaining about what I raised with you at the beginning of this interview, that your report might prejudice legal action. 
Ah. It's the British Conservatives that have not voted in favour of this report because Theresa May needs all the support she can get in the negotiations and she thinks that Viktor Orban is going to give her that support. Now that's power politics, that's party politics. It has nothing to do with European values and fundamental rights. And shame on them. Well, Downing Street has said that the Prime Minister was not consulted by Tory MEPs before the vote. Um, this phrase here is almost unbelievable in its, well, its historical echoes as well, but also in its vileness. And, and this is what Viktor Orban said, uh, I get it exactly right, last March. They do not fight directly, but by stealth. They are not honourable, but unprincipled. They are not national, but international. They do not believe in work, but speculate with money. They have no homeland, but feel that the whole world is theirs. They are not generous, but vengeful, and always attack the heart, especially if it is red, white, and green. Hmm. And thus the marginalization of Hungary's Jews began again. He didn't name them, but of course he didn't have to. These are anti-Semitic tropes which could have come from anywhere between late 18th century German um, rhetoric and uh, the speeches of Adolf, Adolf Hitler. He knew exactly what he was doing. Ethnic nationalism is a tactic deployed by politicians all the way from, from the White House now to Budapest. That's just fact. That's not opinion. I fully appreciate the existence of people who think ethnic nationalism is a great thing. Um, I, I even approve of your existence in the way that you don't approve of the existence of sometimes, for example, Jews. But, but this is not an opinion. This is what Orban is, and it's what Orban does, OK? Daniel Dalton, Amjad Bashir, Emma McClarkin, Jeffrey Van Orden, Ashley Fox, Daniel Hannan, Conservative MEPs, offered an opportunity to vote to condemn this government for its totalitarian tactics, for its, um, well, a whole heap of uh, offences, the notion that judges should be summarily replaced by politicians. The judiciary has been essentially filleted by Viktor Orban. That's the rule of law that you're seeing disappear over the horizon in Hungary. The anti-Semitism that's highlighted in that speech that I just shared with you is inarguable. Um, independent observers very concerned about the state of the last parliamentary election. Media bias, rigged financing, and of course that very, very uh, virulent campaign to attack the Jewish financier and um, Holocaust survivor George Soros. Now, this is another example actually of the right and left meeting, isn't it? Because I, when I criticise Jeremy Corbyn or, or highlight Labour's anti-Semitism, get accused by a small but very vocal rabble of somehow being um, in the pay of the Israel lobby, the phrase that you have to use if you want to just, just leave enough doubt about your anti-Semitic rhetoric to, to avoid proper censure, is that you say, that, oh, she's got an agenda. So he's got an agenda. And then when people ask you what the agenda is, you don't reply. You just go, yeah, oh, right. oh, well, O'Brien would say that. He's got an agenda. That's why he's slagging off Jeremy Corbyn. He's got an agenda. And then some people go further, of course and talk about your paymasters or, or, or Zionist shields. And I, I can guess the reason that you can laugh it off is because it is such a reflection of what goes on on the far right. So these people who think that their sworn enemies are actually identical, and both of them at the moment are trying to turn the word centrist into a pejorative because deep, deep, deep down they recognise that there's extremism and then there's centrism. And there's not a lot else on the table, politically speaking. Um, the similarities between the far right and the far left presumably drive them both potty. The idea that they've got more in common with each other than they have with the rest of us. Because when you start um, <laughs> arguing from the other side, then the same accusations come in in a very, very slightly different flavour. And that flavour is, oh, yeah, it's, he's funded by George Soros. Oh, yeah, so that's your shady Jews pulling strings behind the scenes and, and secretly running the world. Um, if, if I had if I had a pound for every time I've been accused of taking money from George Soros to tell the truth uh, about Brexit, then, well, I'd, I'd, I'd be quite rich, but obviously nowhere near as rich as him. So, so that, that's, that's in place. The Soros stuff is absolute anti-Semitism. I feel a, a, just a tiny, tiny modicum of... Um, 
uh, reservation in saying that out because I'm not Jewish. So I, I, I think it's fair to say that a black person is better qualified than me to talk about whether or not something is white supremacist in its rhetoric. A Jewish person is better qualified than me. I value my opinions. I trust my opinions. I work hard on my opinions, but I'm not Jewish. It seems to me that the portrayal of George Soros is, is a profoundly anti-Semitic trope. Um, but you're welcome to dispute that. And now back to Britain. Also, the blaming of immigrants, obviously, everything is an immigrant's fault in Viktor Orban's... Um, I mean, he's even boasted about wanting an illiberal democracy. It's authoritarianism in, in all but name. So, the, the, the invoking of Article 7, which is the beginning of a procedure... Everything that's wrong in this country at the moment could have been avoided if we'd taken a little bit more time to actually look at and understand the European Parliament over the last 30 years. If we actually knew what happened there and looked at what was being done there by proper politicians rather than fag packet fascists and, and pantomime toffs, then we would not be embarked upon this ludicrous uh, a path of self-harm at the moment. And, and the same is true here. Article 7 is the beginning of a procedure by which sanctions can be imposed upon a member country. And because the European Union upholds values, um, very simply put, values that include, for example, the rule of law and the rejection of anti-Semitism, we don't have to get too sophisticated or complicated about this, then when a member government is in direct contravention of those values, the European Union is in a position to to impose sanctions. Every single governing party in the European Union voted to invoke Article 7, except one. Now, why? They'll come up with some... Uh, we, we put in a few calls. So far, none of them are prepared to talk to us. Uh, the, the, the official defence is that it's nothing to do with Orban and Hungary specifically, it's to do with the European Union overreaching itself. Or, but Article 7 is part of their constitution. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, why? And I'm going to give you my answer to that question. And it's an answer that has to be taken in the context of all of the criticism, much but not all of it justified, of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn's cabal in particular, of anti-Semitism. I don't believe that most of the conservative critics of Labour's anti-Semitism issues give a hoot about Jewish people, or indeed about anti-Semitism. I think they saw it as a very useful stick with which to beat the opposition leader. If I'm wrong, and we've got some phone lines free, if I'm wrong, and we know that they listen on a regular basis, otherwise they wouldn't be able to submit so many complaints to the station. If I'm wrong, Conservative MPs can now ring up and condemn their colleagues in the European Parliament, and I will make room for all of them. Because to be the only governing party in Europe to fail to censure a government led by a man who said this... They do not fight directly but by stealth. They are not honourable but unprincipled. They are not national but international. They do not believe in work but speculate with money. They have no homeland but feel that the whole world is theirs. To be the only European government party to fail to censor this guy says to me that they are not just comfortable with anti-Semitism. They're voting for it. 03456060973. Give me your thoughts. Give me a different analysis if you've got one. By all means, educate me. But what I really want to know is what you think rather than what you know. Because what I think is that this story here, which is getting some coverage, getting some traction now, it wasn't yesterday. This story here is proof for me of something that I feared was true throughout that Corbyn saga and you know i've on the record as, as as believing jeremy corbyn dealt with the problems inadequately and that the problems are real and present i know that they are because of people who, who get in touch with me jeremy corbyn supporters who get in touch with me and claim that i'm, I'm lying to them because i'm paid by jews i mean that that's anti-semitism in a flipping nutshell but an awful lot of the amplification was dishonest and deliberate because otherwise I believe the whole country would have come to a crashing halt in order to unite in the condemnation of these conservative MEPs who uniquely among European governing parties failed to censor a leader whose rhetoric stands comparison with Adolf Hitler's.
If you give me another explanation, especially if you're died in the world Tory, what, what are your lot up to? And why is this getting so much less attention and coverage than problems within the Labour Party confined largely to social media pages and certainly never seen on the floor of the House of Commons. This happened in Parliament. And these were votes that were cast, not ugly messages that were sent to MPs. These were votes that were cast by members of that Parliament. Yeah, I've said it at the beginning of the week. I'm going to say it on the last show that we spent together today. I'm tempted every morning just to come on air and say, what's going on? What is going on? Is this as virulent and as ugly and as dangerous as it appears to be to my untutored eye? And if it is, why the hell hasn't the world stopped in the way that it did for Jeremy Corbyn's anti-Semitism problem? Strange times. Government seeking an injunction to stop prison officers protesting outside prisons. <laughs> We're talking about an authoritarian regime in Hungary and the Conservative Party's failure to join every other governing party in the region in censuring them um, for a path of authoritarianism. I want you to tell me what you think is going on. Robert's in Liverpool. Robert, what would you like to say? Robert, are you there? Uh, Sorry, mate. Yeah, Start again. Yeah. Carry on. Can you hear me? I can. What's on your mind? OK, I was just going to say, I believe the Conservative Party aren't going to censor Victor Orban because uh, I think they see Victor Orban as a bit of uh, an ally in, uh, in the, the breakup of uh, the European Union, uh, which in a way it plays into the Conservative Party's hands to have Victor Orban as an ally at this stage, uh, especially if uh, he, um, he, which, which I think he wants to fall out of Europe. Uh, and so I think, well, Orban he can't that, afford to. I think he probably wants uh, to. He wants to pull out of some of the uh, yeah. requirements of membership yeah. that, that, that of you would does, yeah. this, this common true, yeah. common decency. But he certainly wouldn't yeah. want to pull out economically. It would be it would be disastrous. Yeah. And there are, of course, yeah, reports possibly. reports in Hungary of him and his family trousering quite a lot of the money that makes its way into the country from from <laughs> the European <laughs> Union. But does that yeah. then mean well, that? And I don't know how closely you follow the Labour anti-Semitism issues. Okay. They're quite pertinent up in Liverpool, but. Yeah. Um, that means that most of the Conservatives queuing up to condemn Jeremy Corbyn for, quotes, failing to address the anti-Semitism problem, end quotes, don't actually give a hoot about anti-Semitism because they're quite happy to greenlight it in this context. Yeah, yeah, well, well, I, I get what you're saying. I, I feel that uh, Labour will always, I mean, not Labour, the Conservative Party will always jump on Labour uh, to, to uh, kick them in the... I have to be careful what I say, don't I? Um, kick them up the bum. But yes. anything that you do, anything that you say, if they're, if they're not seen as protecting a particular uh, group of people or they're seen as uh, um, being... Uh any excuse, any excuse for a slap, as you might say, 24 minutes after 10, um, the best argument, uh, Philip Collins writes rather, rather well in the Times today, as, as usual in fact, on this issue, um, and he points out uh, that some of the claims from all the Conservative MAPs who were miraculously too busy to talk to me today um, are a little bit hollow because they essentially boil down to the notion that... Um, the procedures of the European Union are somehow an evil greater than the targeting of minorities and the flouting of fair rules in a member state. And they're right there, in a nutshell, is, is the absurdity of the position being adopted by the likes of Daniel Hannan, claiming, no, 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 we're merely trying to oppose the, the accretion of more powers by the European Union. So invoking an article that's within their own constitution is somehow a more egregious offence against, I don't know what they are in defence of anymore, these people, these headbangers, these unicornists, than actually undermining the rule of law and targeting minorities. I mean, what, what do you go into politics for if not to uphold the rule of law and to protect vulnerable people from bullies? I don't know, actually. I, obviously, I'm a bit of a snowflake because these people seem to have gone into politics because <laughs> rubbish at everything else and they thought they could make a few quid. Matthew's in Dublin. Matthew, what's going on? Yeah, essentially, it's just... Um, Orban has been quite a supporter of the UK position in Brexit negotiations. Uh, so essentially, we haven't, really got a ally. we haven't really got a position. I mean, he, well, he does, the, well, does hot air, doesn't, doesn't he? He sort of there. cheers. He cheers without. I mean, we don't know what our position is, but he cheers well, it we anyway. Just moved the yardstick. It was yeah. going to be a good thing, and now it's not going to be the end of the world. So provided yeah. the world doesn't end on like the first of April, it's you know, it's a win. Back all round yes. champagne for everyone. Yes. Yeah. Welcome to number ten, everyone. So, so he's an ally, yeah. but he's really, really vile. He is vile, but the kind of the suspension under Article 7 
includes a suspension of like the voting rights yes um on the european council so obviously they're kind of hoping that it's like that, you know, when it comes down to the 11th hour like the evil hour that they can like turn up with a check for like billions of pounds mm. and at the last you know at, at the evil hour there might be some people around the table that all of a sudden you know move to support their position and kind of he is one of those people I mean, he's unpleasant, isn't he, basically? Well, he's, so. de- he's deeply unpleasant. You're, you're, like the last caller, you're steering away from what I wanted to examine most. That might be because I've called it wrong, and it, this isn't the most interesting thing about the whole issue. I think the, the understanding of why these um, uh, Conservative MEPs, who are miraculously all too busy to talk to you or me this morning, have voted to support this vile anti-Semite up pretty clear and it is linked to the fact that we've got very few friends now in the world and so when you've got very few friends in the world um in a way you end up getting into bed with all sorts of monsters which is precisely what they have elected to do the fact that they're the party of government makes it a rather more important issue but we talked i mean it feels some mornings i've come into work that the anti-semitism in the labor party has been the only political story in town while while parliament was in recess and all of the conservative commentators, politicians and, and, and columnists queuing up to condemn Corbyn in the roundest of terms. Actually, let's be clear, quite a lot of people who would identify as left-wing queuing up to condemn Corbyn in the roundest of terms. In my view, mostly rightly, they're all silent on this. Does that allow me to conclude that all of the people who criticise Corbyn for anti-Semitism actually don't care about anti-Semitism because they've stayed silent on this one? Well, most people that criticise people are doing so for their own political aspirations. So well, we're not. When, no, no, OK. <laughs> but a lot of people that criticise him, criticise him, say Labour politicians, more moderate ones, maybe criticise him because they, they, they hope for a return to a more centrist or, Labour or, party. Or they genuinely despise anti-Semitism and believe that if you don't come down on it like a ton yeah, well, of bricks that, the first that's time a moral, it appears. That's a morally yes. good position to take. Yes. Um, but... In, you know, amongst politicians, there are some with morally good positions uh, and others that, uh, kind of, you know, chase their own aspirations. So I think it's condemn stuff when it suits you to condemn it and, and don't when it doesn't. Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a roundabout way of saying yes, James. I completely agree with you. They, they are complete hypocrites. If they're not coming out to condemn their own party members for doing this, who the hell did they think they were condemning Jeremy Corbyn for not doing more to condemn his own party members, who were mostly you know, sort of weirdos and banner wavers very much in the background, whereas these people are sitting in the European Parliament and offering their support to an absolutely stone-cold anti-Semite. 03456060973. How do Jewish listeners feel about this, particularly Jewish listeners who perhaps lean towards the Conservative Party? This must be heartbreaking. I, I, I'm not putting words into your mouth, but I know an awful lot of people have felt very, very, very alienated from the Labour Party. History suggests that that means you at least have a look at the Conservative Party and then you find out that they've been sitting in the European Parliament offering their democratic support to a man who has very, very consciously and very effectively employed the most ancient of anti-Semitic tropes. It's coming up to half past ten. 03456060973 is the number that you need. And Sam in Redhill reminds me that, of course, there have been attacks on the Romani people in Hungary as well. Um, and I always have one word in my mind when I'm reminded of the Romani involvement in the Holocaust. Uh, it, there were more people per capita killed by the Nazis, more Romani people, more Roma killed by the Nazis than Jews. Did you know that? As a percentage of the overall population. And do you know the word they used to describe the Holocaust? Porajmos, which translates literally as the devouring. Later in the programme, we'll be looking at the um, school where children have apparently been told that if they wore longer skirts, they could protect themselves from sexual harassment. We're looking at the rights and wrongs of that intervention, but also the rather trickier question of whether it actually contains a kernel of truth. I'm hoping not, but you're going to tell me. And then we will, I think, despite it being rather against my own financial interests, possibly attempt to portray Mark Carney's warning that house prices could fall by 35% as having a, at least 
a small silver lining to it, given that I don't know anyone under the age of 40 who hasn't either won the lottery or inherited a large amount of money who um, considers property ownership to be a, a natural part of their adult life. 10.35 is the time. Before that, back to Hungary, back to the Conservative Party, and back to the question of how Jeremy Corbyn has somehow spent the entire year fending off mostly accurate accusations of anti-Semitism. But when the Conservative Party essentially become the only governing party in Europe to fail to vote against the anti-Semitic regime of Viktor Orban in Hungary. Oh, nothing to see here. We, no, we can't talk to James, but we can send a statement. I can't talk to James, but what James needs to understand is, no, I'm afraid I won't be able to come on air, but but, but could you pass this on to James? This is what, that's what Beth's getting this morning. None of them will talk to me. Yet. 0345 973 lads, you know the number. Um, it seems to me there's a massive double standard in place, and even more worryingly, it suggests that an awful lot of people were very cynically and very dangerously using the Labour Party's anti-Semitic scandal to hurt the Labour Party while not actually caring one jot about either anti-Semitism or the Jewish people at whom it is historically directed. But I'm not really qualified to answer that. I think that my guest Alex Goldberg is. I, I, I met Alex a few years ago when I used to do those Sunday morning ethics and, and religion shows, and I, I'm, I'm sure he won't mind me saying that I found him to be one of the most incisive and accessible of speakers. In fact, my own journey on the understanding of, of, of anti-Semitism itself, he, he won't know this, but he played a part in it himself. So I'm delighted to have him on the programme. He is currently the um, university chaplain at the University of Surrey and a human rights activist. And I'll read out what you wrote on Twitter earlier, Alex, if I may. And then you can expand on it for us. You wrote, over the last 10 years, I've seen schools of Jewish students from Hungary coming to our university, fleeing a hostile climate of anti-Semitism as uh, Hungary has fallen to rising populism. Their stories are deeply concerning. I hope politicians of all hues listen to them. Good morning, Alex Goldberg. Good morning, James. That's a, that's a fairly grim story that you tell. It is a grim story. I think in any other generation, and I say this because of the students I'm talking about are European Union citizens and they have the right to come here as students, but in any other generation, the, the students would have been applying for uh, asylum and refugee status. They're not because they're freely allowed to travel within the European Union. And the stories are grim. Um, uh, I, maybe it's illustrative about one student that came to me um, she had a Jewish dad, and, um, and, and her, her mother wasn't Jewish, but she came in one day and said, I don't understand. That. Why is there all this hatred? I don't understand anything about my, my heritage and my people. And she spent the next three months coming backwards and forwards, just learning about Judaism. And the only reason she started to do, learn about Judaism and Jewish history was because of the onslaught of anti-Semitism, uh, which is now really state-sponsored anti-Semitism uh, you know, within Budapest. And uh, now originally, uh, the, the anti-Semitic party 10, 15 years ago was Jobbik, which is a, uh, a far-right party which used to have a paramilitary wing. Uh, highly anti-Semitic, also doesn't like the uh, Roma population. Um, more recently, has become Islamophobic, um, uh, more, more in terms of its anti-immigration policy to stop people coming in. Um, but it seems Fidesz, which is the main political party in the uh, party of Orban, while starting as Orban started as a liberal, and actually some of his, some of, well, originally he took money from George Soros, um, and um, but more recently he's an individual who has honoured the wartime leaders of Hungary who were in alliance with the Nazis and Hitler. Uh, over 400,000 Jews were deported from Hungary, but there was a substantial population that survived the war. Uh, um, ran, and there were around about 80,000 Jews in Hungary today. A very secular community, not like the mm. Jewish community in Britain, which does identify religiously and does identify culturally, but after many years of, of communism and uh, and, and the lack of freedom of religion, there isn't much knowledge in that community about their own religious identity, but it's suddenly it's stuck in their face. Uh, the last elections this summer, uh, George uh, Soros' 
portrayed in anti-Semitic terms. Orban never uses the word Jew necessarily, but talks about internationalists and financiers and uh, terms that we used in the 1930s and 50s, just like, um, uh, you know, cosmopolitan, uh, rootless cosmopolitan, uh, which only kind of uh, are about, about Jews. Um, and he's using buzzwords which the Hungarian population knows. He's honouring that wartime leader and, uh, and he's allowing, you know, far-right marches and fascistic marches and some of them quite violent marches uh, and scaring a Jewish population on a daily basis uh, over a very, very long period of time. I, I, I'm glad that you've broadened the, the, the remit from, from just anti-Semitism. Brought, you've brought Muslim people into it as well and Roma people because mm. the, 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 this is what... And I'm going to steer you next towards the Conservative Party's decision to whip its 18 MEPs to vote against the motion censuring all bans. Mm -hmm. um, government, because it's interesting to see who else um, they voted with. They voted with Poland's Law and Justice Party. They voted with France's National Front. They voted with the with the Sweden Democrats to essentially uphold a regime that openly and proudly subverts democratic norms. Um, I, I, just tell me how you feel about that. This is this well, is the party the, of government, the only government in Europe that, that whipped its its members to sure, do this. Sure. The, the Conservative Party in, within the European Parliament split from all the other mainstream centre-right parties. Uh, back when David Cameron became leader, there was a huge debate between him and David Davis. David Davis said, we've got to leave the European People's Party. Now, this is people like Merkel's part, Angela Merkel's party. It used to be the old Republican Party of Sarkozy. Uh, that, that alliance and formed its own alliance. And one of those parties is the Law and Order Party in Poland, which has a similar probe by the European Parliament. And, and those going around for the European Parliament is undemocratic. That's, that's the Parliament that you, me, and the rest yes. of Europe vote for. So I don't quite know. And it, there's a similar probe coming out about Poland that, that was, you know, in the same vein as Hungary, which also has its problems. So perhaps, <laughs> perhaps it's my, my friend's friend is my enemy. And I've seen Daniel Dalton saying, well, I'll vote. Our vote has, is, you know, uh, our vote, uh, Daniel Dalton, the leader of the uh, Conservatives in the European yes. Parliament, saying that uh, distancing himself from Orban while still supporting the vote. And I think we're in such machinations that uh, perhaps the Conservative Party thought nobody would notice the European Parliament or no nobody would notice the way they voted. Right now, there has been a closing up to two groups. One is the Visegrad group. The Visegrad group are the four countries that came into the European Union together. So that's Poland, Hungary, uh, the Czech Republic and Slovakia uh, because they, 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 are, they have Eurosceptic governments which may favour also trade deals or a more favourable deal with the EU, with Britain. But there's, all, there's been that alliance between the Conservatives and those countries. Uh, and, um, and, and also we're seeing... Um, you know, certain conservative leaders, even in, in Westminster, cozying up to people like Steve Bannon, who used to be Trump's advisor, who's going around some of these right-wing parties like the Front National uh, and other European populist parties like Fidesz. Fidesz is a populist party. Yes. Uh, and, and populism needs to feed off. Uh, xenophobia. It needs to feed off anti-Semitism. It needs to feed off Islamophobia. It needs to feed off the other. And it needs to produce hatred. And I, I see in Europe right now a double tsunami. On one, on one side we have the rise of the populist right, and maybe even in response to it, but maybe not, we have a hard left which is becoming much more vocal. The sort of anti-Semitism that you speak about every day on, the hard, on your program from the hard left. And there's a sort of double tsunami, and if we're not careful, it's going to mean that Jewish people feel more and more edged out of the political process. The, the political mainstream, whether they're conservative, Lib Dems, or, or Labour, should be standing up and saying, you know, we're, we're part of that, uh, you know, a diverse country, a multi-religious, multicultural country, uh, and we should be standing up against all forms of racism. We've moved on from the 1970s in so many wonderful ways, uh, and attitudes uh, amongst well, well, you know, younger people today, I think it is good. It, it must be good for your soul print. to work Sorry? with the, It must be very good for your soul to work with the students, actually, to work with the young people, because you... Uh, you <laughs> I think so. Uh, yeah, I, I love working with young people. Um, um, 
I'm really, I'm really, I'm really grateful they found a home in the University of Surrey. Yes. Uh, some have gone on to do PhDs and are are adding to our scientific community. Some are becoming doctors in the NHS, and and one of them went into the uh, <laughs> is is is, is going into the radio media business. What? That's, that's worth going into. Outrageous. But it's uh, <laughs> contributing to our society. D d yes. Um, briefly. I, I, yeah. I could listen to you all day, actually, but I, I, but I can't. <laughs> um, briefly, the, 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 I, am, I don't think mischievously, uh, my, my intention is, is sincere, comparing the reaction to what the Conservatives have done in the European Parliament and the problems that Jeremy Corbyn, as you mentioned, which I do speak about a lot on the programme, um, I, I, I see a massive double standard in how Conservatives who were queuing up to castigate and condemn Jeremy Corbyn are today uni formally and unanimously silent on the behaviour of their own party members and, and most pertinently, the whipping of those party members. Yeah, I don't think, you know, uh, I don't think, it becomes very difficult, doesn't it? Once you are in a glass house, you can't, you can't uh, throw stones. From my perspective, I'm concerned uh, about a feeling of friendlessness on, on, on both sides. There are, there are people that are very close to the Jewish community, a supporter of the Jewish community in the Labour Party. There are people who are close and supportive of the Jewish community uh, in the Conservative Party, and they do stand up and condemn anti-Semitism both outside their party and within. And, and, I, and they, they are starting to become increasingly vocal. But you can't have a double standard where you, uh, you use... Uh, uh, I feel like we are being used as a community, uh, as a political football. And what I really want to do is live in a society without hatred, without fear, and to get on with my life. I, I, I've, I've said this in the past to other people who have asked me on their programme, whether it's about Labour or the Conservatives, I'd love to come and, onto your programme and talk about homelessness or the environment or, or, yes. or, or society and economics. But um, sadly, I'm talking to you about anti-Semitism. Well, we'll keep we'll in Hungary <laughs> or in the Labour Party. Yeah. And I don't want that to continue. No, well, nor do I, actually. I will invite you on to talk about something else, but I won't wait until the anti-Semitism problem has, has gone away, because I suspect if we were to make that condition, it, it, would, be, it would be unbearably long. Alex Goldberg, um, barrister, chaplain, human rights activist, and, and incredibly articulate commentator, in my humble. It's 10.48. Who do you think wrote this in April of this year? Go on, have a guess. Congratulations to Fidesz and Viktor Orban on winning the elections in Hungary. We look forward to working with our Hungarian friends to further develop our close partnership. Who do you think said that? That was April of this year. That's after... The government in Hungary has taken away licenses from broadcasters that are critical, not even critical of the government, actually, that are just objective, you know. Very Trumpian, actually, I suppose, to say that they're biased when they're telling the truth about you. Um, what else has he done when, when this tweet was written by a prominent British politician? Judges um, uh, replaced in a torrent of vicious rhetoric, writes Philip Collins in The Times today, about how the judiciary is full of the robed mercenaries of George Soros. Rigged financing and, and media mean that the recent parliamentary in, uh, election was described by independent observers as free but not fair. That's one of my favourite subjects. How can it be a free choice if 99% of the chatter is on one side of the argument and 1% of it is on the other? I could say that about Brexit, actually, in terms of informed consent. There's no way that that was a, a, a fair referendum. Uh, I'm speaking about my own vote there. I wasn't qualified to vote in that referendum. I'm probably qualified now, but I certainly wasn't qualified nearly two and a half years ago. So journalists losing their jobs, judges losing their jobs, the rule of law being undermined, corruption being um, profoundly suspected, immigrants, especially Muslims, being blamed for everything that's gone wrong ever in Hungary. And um, of course, a cooperation pact with the Russian President Vladimir Putin, who we saw on our screens yesterday, has uh, essentially turned the murder of a British citizen and the, the attempted murder of, of one other into uh, an international sitcom. So, who wrote this in April of 2018? Congratulations to Fidesz and Viktor Orban on winning the elections in Hungary. We look forward to working with our Hungarian friends to further develop our close partnership. Go on, have a guess. Boris Johnson. All day long. But remember, it's the Labour Party that's got a problem with anti-Semitism. Michael's in Manchester. Michael, what would you like to say? 
I don't know why you're surprised about the Conservative I'm Party. Surprised. James. This is a party that you know has put Zach Goldsmith forward, who has led a vile, racist campaign against Sadiq Khan. It's a party that has promoted Boris Johnson into the shadow cabinet, despite all the shadow cabinet, the cabinet, mate. Keep up. <laughs> despite all the comments that he's made, you know, it's a party that Baroness Wazi described as being. Uh, with Islamophobia being very widespread. It's a fundamentally racist party, so we should not be surprised that they are siding with uh, the comments that are just vile and they are very Hitler-esque. It's not in any way surprising. Well, they're not. I mean, to be clear, I completely understand why you say what you say, but the quotes that I've, I've shared were not part of the motion on which the Conservatives were invited to vote. Uh, I mean, it's essentially uh, an act of censure, the beginning of a procedure under which sanctions can be imposed for sort of breaking the rules of membership, as it were, with regard to the rule of law and, and sundry other things like that. I think Giva Hofstad put it best when he he said that if Hungary was applying to join the European Union today, it would not be granted entry. It's sliding away from democracy. Um, that is the EU's role, of course, to, to uphold that democracy. It makes it even more heartbreaking, of course, to reflect upon all the bovine Brexiters who argued that it was somehow a, an enemy of democracy. So I, I take on board what you're saying, but that, those quotes about the international rootless individuals are not part of this this actual vote, um, but it's part of the same party. That, that yeah, the but it's also the party of it's also the party of Saeed Avasi, um, a former chair of the Conservative Party, who retweeted my comments yesterday, saying precisely what I've repeated today about the despicable double standard being displayed by by the Conservatives. So, uh, you're clearly a Labour supporter, and that's absolutely fine. But but I, I don't indulge in the in the in the United versus City analysis of British no, but, politics. But there are plenty of decent people in the Conservative Party. I just wish they'd be a little bit louder this morning. In fairness, James, though, I mean, we've listened to, to the countless attacks yes. the media have portrayed against Jeremy Corbyn, including yourself, because let's be honest, your representation of Jeremy Corbyn's um, anti-Semitism row has been a lot louder than the other rows that have been going on in the Conservative Party, as a has been across the whole Absolute hogwash, mate. This is the problem when you can't see how good City are playing because you're so okay, slavishly okay. so devoted let, let, to United. Let, let me, Windrush, let comparing... Correct. No, 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 no. Let me tell but you. But the Labour Party haven't done anything even vaguely comparable to Windrush. Windrush is a hundred times worse than the, anything has gone on the, the, the Labour, Labour Party. Party did actually set in motion some of the things that led to Windrush, but I've been... Abs I'm not here to defend myself against your claim that I'm biased against Jeremy Corbyn. I'm just going to laugh it out of court, mate, because if you want to go and line up any of the um, uh, people advising Jeremy Corbyn or the people advising Theresa May and ask them what I spend more time doing, criticising the government or criticising the opposition, you'll actually get unanimous answers. So I wish okay. you'd leave well, us alone, let, but let I condemn the party a lot more. Let me report from the LSE that they, that they no, said mate, about it's, the media's no, betrayal of it's, Jeremy it's, Corbyn. It's three years old and I've read it out on the programme, Michael. Why would I want to invite you on to do it again? Because I don't think you understand that you're part of it. I've read it out on the programme, Michael. Why do you portray people who support Jeremy Corbyn? I as haven't. I've, portray I've portrayed slavish people who admit no criticism of Jeremy Corbyn as cultish and foolish because what they do is they ring a radio programme dedicated to criticising the Conservative Party and they start whining and moaning about people who criticise Jeremy Corbyn. Can you think of any examples? James, what I don't think you no, can. No, come on, you can. Go on, just think a bit harder. You must be able to think of an example of someone who's found a radio station that has a programme dedicated to criticism of the Conservative Party and has turned it in an opportunity to whine about someone who sometimes criticises Jeremy Corbyn. Come on, we can, well, between us, the first, the first let's get an example. Today, you've actually said that this has been used we can get an example. Can you think of an Which example? Is the first time. Can yes, you, James. Go on, I'm who? I'm going to refer to myself here. Oh, OK, you? well oh. done. You see, we can always find common ground to agree on if we work hard enough. You silly old sausage. What are you going to do today? Oh, there's a bloke on the radio really sticking it to the Tories for being anti-Semitic and hypocritical. So what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to ring him and have a go about the fact that he sometimes criticises Jeremy Corbyn. Michael, you're a genius. It's, it's, it's like three times a week. Which is, is, you're a genius, like mate. Corbyn, you're a genius. It's coming up to 11 o'clock. You're listening to Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Corbyn on LBC. That'll be the day. He did come in once, didn't he? When Sadiq Khan was doing my holiday cover. I'm sure Michael would um, have a brilliant explanation for why that was probably just a coincidence. Didn't realise I was away. And there it is. Sometimes when I do my introductions and I describe the people like Michael to you, I wonder if I'm exaggerating or if I'm allowing my exposure to social media to actually cloud my judgement on people and what they would do in real life.
Right, but there you have it. Conclusive proof of just how blinkered and tribal these people are. There's a bloke on the radio absolutely going for the Conservatives over their double standards, their hypocrisy and their endorsement of anti-Semitism. So what are you going to do today, Mr Corbynite? I'm going to phone him up and have a go about the fact that he sometimes says mean things about Jeremy. And that, my friends, is why we're in the mess we're in and why people like me are politically homeless. I do